but there is much to say, there is much to talk about. I'm excited about the lesson idea the Lord has given me for this camp because I view it as very practical for us as Christians and those of you who are going to become Christians, this will be valuable information if you'll tuck it away somewhere and we're trusting the Lord to help us. But uh, our relationship to the world will be the first probably half of the Bible studies and then we're going to talk about what it means to live life in the Spirit. We're living in two different worlds as Christians. Yes, sir. We're living in two different worlds, and they are diametrically opposed to each other. But we're here, and there's certain things about this world that we have to use. There's certain things we have to do and partake of and work and labor and buy and sell. And, you know, there's things in the world that Christians just can't go out on a mountainside somewhere and become... Monks, I guess, <laughs> you know, hermits, cave dwellers, you know, God doesn't want us to do that. No. So what is, and, and my, my whole idea is to try to help us to understand our relationship to the world as Christians, and then our relationship to the spiritual world as Christians. <laughs> So we're going to try to lay a foundation this morning. If you have your Bibles, turn into Revelations chapter 1, verses 9 and 10. Revelations chapter 1, verses 9 and 10. This is an illustration of what I'm talking about. John was living in two completely different worlds on this particular morning. You want to stand for the reading of the two verses if you're able? Give you a rest a little bit. Revelations chapter 1. I, John, who also am your brother and companion in tribulation and in the kingdom and patience of Jesus Christ, who was in the isle that is called Patmos for the word of God, for the testimony of Jesus Christ. I was in the spirit. On the Lord's day, and heard behind me a great voice as of a trumpet. Father, we thank you this morning for your infallible word, your inerrant, your preserved word for us this morning. We ask you to bless the reading and the preaching, teaching of thy word this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Did you catch the two parallels? And one in verse 9, he said, uh, I am your brother and companion in tribulation. <laughs> Jesus said, in this world, you'll have tribulation. Yes. In me, you'll have peace. <laughs> but John was in, he was a fellow companion of us who are having trouble. But he also said, I'm also in the kingdom and patience of Jesus Christ. So I'm here in this world of trouble, but I'm also in the kingdom of God. Then he says in verse 10, I was on the Isle of Patmos. Maybe we need to think about that. Look into that just a moment. The Isle of Patmos was an island that the Romans used as a place to punish people. It was a volcanic island. It was pretty bare and rocky and nothing much going on there except there were some mining operations, they say. And Rome put those people that they wanted to punish on the Isle of Patmos. Not the ones they wanted to kill, they killed those. But if it wasn't something they felt worthy of death, but they wanted to punish you, so they banished you to the Isle of Patmos. That barren, looked like God forsaken little island there. And that's where John was on this particular Sunday morning, this particular Lord's Day. Physically, geographically, humanly, he was in a place of punishment. He had been lifted out of a place of power, position, love, deep respect. He was the last living apostle. He was revered. He was an old man now. And yet he was taken out of his church family, that secure place among friends and loved ones and people who esteemed him highly, he was yanked out of there by the Roman authorities and put over on this God-forsaken place with a bunch of criminals or prisoners. 
That's quite a difference, isn't it? I mean, that's quite a drastic change in one's life. But that is life. Our circumstances change. That's part of living in this world. That's part of being a part of this economy. And as humans and as Christians, we're none of us exempt from those circumstances in life that are troubling, discomforting, disagreeable, negative, painful. None of us are exempt from those kind of circumstances. So we're living in this sin-cursed world. We're living in this world that's plagued with pain and tribulation and problems and opposition to the Christian. We're plagued with that. But on the other hand, John said, I was also, I was there, I was on the Isle of Patmos. Wouldn't you like to know the details of the trial? Wouldn't you like to know the details of his arrest? Huh? The Bible leaves out so many details that I would like to know. But the author of the Bible is all wise, so I don't need to know. <laughs> but there are things that you just wonder, how did they get him? What charge did they raise against him? How many cops did it take to pick him up? <laughs> you know, how many squad cars were there that day? You know, how many, how many SWAT teams came to arrest this old preacher? Uh, did he resist arrest? No, he didn't, no. But he was in this world of problems and care and turmoil and now he's in a forsaken place with no friends and no family and no church to go to. And how do you deal with that? You get in the spirit. <laughs> you let the Lord help you. And see, that's such a contrast how could a man under those conditions who's just been stripped from all that he knew was good and right, doing the right things for the right reason, serving God with all of his heart, and yet he comes to the place that all of that is removed from him, or he is removed from it. And he's taken to this place where there's nothing but loneliness and grief. It doesn't give us his accommodations, but I can't imagine Rome made it very pleasant. They had a knack for punishing people they wanted to punish. Rome just had a knack for that. They could devise some of the most awful, hideous ways to punish people they wanted to get even with. So I can't imagine that John's accommodations was the Hilton. <laughs> and I can't imagine that his food was from Logan's Steakhouse or... Roadhouse, Grill, or wherever. I can't imagine that it was Ruth Crisp Steakhouse. <laughs> Places you only hear about, you know. But can you imagine the change in this man's life? How could he be where he is this Lord's Day under the circumstances he was under? That's a great mystery. But that is the paradox of the Christian life. You see some of God's choicest saints shining in the furnace. In the time of affliction, you see the glory of God, just like King, what's his name, saw the form of the fourth man in the furnace with the Hebrew children. He saw the form of Jesus in there with them. They were in the fire. They weren't crying the blues. I'll give you another biblical illustration before we get into this. In the 16th chapter of Acts, you can read it this afternoon, there was two missionaries named Paul and Silas. They went to a little town called Philippi. They run into trouble. I think he ran into trouble almost everywhere he went. They accused him of being a troublemaker. But he wasn't. He was a peacemaker, if they'd only listened to the message. But Paul and Silas were there and they brought these false accusations against them and the angry mob grabbed them. The magistrates rent off their clothes. They beat them unmercifully. You read it in the 16th chapter of Acts. They beat those two men unmercifully. Then they cast them into the prison. Not just the prison, but into the inner prison. <clears throat> I had a prison ministry in Ohio. 
And I was there for four years, and there was a place, maybe some of you guys know the term, the hole. Somebody's been to the hole. That was real quick. That's the inner prison. That's solitary confinement. That's the place you go when you've been really, really bad. Or, I found out while I was in there that some of the guys went there because they wanted to be protected from somebody else. You, you did something to get thrown in the hole to keep the rest of this gang from killing you or whatever they want to do with you. Prison life is an awful thing. But here's a man who's a preacher. Two preachers, two missionaries. They're in prison, they're in the hole. And they're not just sitting in the hole, but they're in stocks. They're in stocks. These wooden contraptions, you stick your legs in the bottom holes, you stick your neck and arms in the upper holes, and they clamp the yoke down over your neck and you hang there. Try hanging out in the stocks for a few hours. It'll make you want to pray and shout. Not in the human. But that's just exactly what they did at midnight. I can imagine Paul looked over to Silas and said, sing me number 23 in our hymn book. The Lord is our shepherd. The Lord is our shepherd. I shall not want. And they begin to sing songs, begin to sing praises. They begin to pray at midnight in the stocks with their backs still bleeding and oozing from the beating they'd received. How do you do that? In one world in the human But in another world, in your spiritual life, it is possible, fellas, to live in both worlds. That's my objective for this Bible study, is to show us why the world is in opposition to us, what it means for us to interact with the world, and how we should interact with the world, and then how we can find this life in the Spirit. Let's look at the Scriptures. John is awaking, and every believer is going to find himself But in order to live life in the spirit, in order to have a part in the heavenly kingdom, Jesus made it very plain, and our brother McCoy preached a good preparation message for this lesson last night. I don't have to labor it at all. John 3, 6, it's at the bottom paragraph of your first page on the inside. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the spirit is spirit. There is a natural body, There is a spiritual component to you, okay? You have a natural life. You can have a spiritual life. As we come into this world, our spiritual life because of sin is dead. Jesus came to give us new life in the spirit. He didn't come to give you a new new birth of the body. Nicodemus, you got it all wrong, dude. You're not going back to the womb. You're not going back to the womb. That's impossible. It's unnecessary. The body's not really that important. It's the spirit that's life. It's the spirit that will live on forever. So you can have physical life this morning and not have, did I say physical life? You can have physical life this morning and not have spiritual life. And until you have the new birth, until you're born again, You cannot see the kingdom of heaven. John 3, 5 says, Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born of water and of the spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. Marvel not that I said unto you, you must be born again. One cannot have spiritual life without a birth. You didn't have physical life without a birth. You weren't hatched. You were given life by your mama. You had a birth. You have a birthday. Same thing is true in the spiritual. You have a birthday. You have a point in time where you was not saved, but you met God's conditions that we heard last night, and you got saved. That's being born again. Say, can I can I can I birth myself? Did you birth yourself the first time? Did you have anything to do with it? Your mama birthed you. If you're a Christian, the Holy Spirit birthed you. The Holy Spirit gave you new life. He's the only one 
that can give life. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. life. Salvation is life. Spiritual life. Eternal life. And I, I wish I had time to really blow that up, but I don't this morning with this context. But you have to have him do something in you that brings you into the kingdom of God, into the realm of spiritual life. Something up here doesn't like me. I move certain ways and it squeals at me. But spiritual life is God's work. Meeting God's condition at an altar is your responsibility. Coming to terms with God is our part. All we have to do is meet the conditions. God's laid out a contract. I will save you if you will repent and believe. Amen? Amen. It's a contract. And God keeps his word. So all we need to do is find ourselves in a mode of repentance and a mode of truly trusting and relying on Jesus Christ and God will bring us into the realm of a spiritual man or woman. Why does he need to do that? Well, Corinthians, second page, chapter 2, verse 12, now we have received not the spirit of the world but the spirit which is of God that we might know the things that are freely given to us of God. Which things also we speak, not in the words which man's wisdom teacheth, but which the Holy Ghost teacheth, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. Now listen to this verse. But the natural man, the physical man, receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him. Neither can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. How many of you this morning that are not saved looked at this crowd and said, I don't understand this? I was there one day. I looked at this Christian crowd. I said, what makes them tick? I wondered what made them tick. I wondered what made my godly grandmother live the way she lived, pray the way she prayed, love the way she loved, was hospitable the way she was hospitable. My granny's home was always open to anybody that wanted to stop, even spend the night. Bring your jammies, come on over. Granny's house was open to everybody. And the first thing she wanted to do is ask you if you wanted something to eat. That's southern hospitality, by the way. Good old Virginia, West Virginia, Kentucky hospitality. First thing they want to do when you come to meet them, have y'all had supper, have y'all had something to eat? Let us fix you a bite to eat. And they would fix you a meal. Not just a bite, they'd fix you a meal to eat. And then it wouldn't be long till Granny began to tell you what Jesus had done for her. Or she'd say, children, do you want to pray? Let's kneel down here in the living room and pray. God puts something in the heart of Christians that wants to do spiritual things, good things. The natural man doesn't understand that. I didn't understand what made her tick all the much. I didn't understand why she wanted to be in church every time the church doors opened. That was foreign to me. I didn't want to go. But the natural man does not receive the things of the Spirit. So don't be amazed if, if you're sitting back there and all this seems like Greek and Latin. Ask God to give you a spiritual birth. Ask God to make you a spiritual man or woman. Ask God to come into your heart and bring you over into the realm of a spiritual person so that he can begin to teach you and show you and change you into the person that he wants you to be. I say hallelujah. That's a good transformation. Some of us needed to be changed. I'm glad that Jesus changed my life. But the natural man, the unsaved man, the unregenerated man does not receive the things of God, does not understand them by and large. <coughs> now, if you've been raised in a Christian home and you're a sinner this morning, you probably understand some things. doesn't mean you, you can't understand anything. But the deep things of God and the spiritual communion with God and the fellowship with God is reserved for those that are born into the family of God. But the natural man does not receive the things of God. As a spiritual person, as a saved person, that has been born of God's spirit, we have pledged ourselves and our allegiance to our new 
Heavenly Father and our new Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I now belong to him. My Bible says that I am bought with a price. I am redeemed with not corruptible things such as silver and gold. But I have been bought or redeemed by the blood of Jesus Christ. I owe him everything. So I surrendered everything when I realized that. I gave him my life. You want to give him your life. I gave him my will so that he could choose my path. You can give him your will. Look where your will's got you now. Look where my will got me. Friends, God didn't only save my soul that November night. He saved my life. He not only saved my soul and life, he saved my marriage. My home was on the rocks before Jesus came into our home. I owe him everything this morning and I pledge allegiance to him. I am now a citizen of a heavenly kingdom. I have a heavenly king who my Bible says is the king of all kings and the Lord of all lords. Aren't you glad to be serving the ultimate king of kings? The one to whom every knee will bow and every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. He's going to be confessed as Lord by everyone. Every atheist, every agnostic, every skeptic, every backslider, every hardened sinner, every reprobate, every demon in hell is going to confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. I'm glad I did it now. When it wasn't mandatory, it was voluntary. Every person in the kingdom of God in this system right now is voluntary. He doesn't make anyone serve him. He could. He could flip your switch and you'd become a little robot. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. He doesn't want robots. He wants willful, loving, living human beings to serve him and love him and be true to him. He's been true to us. He's been faithful to us. I want to reciprocate. I want to turn that back around, don't you? Amen. That's what a spiritual person has in their heart. They pledge allegiance to another master. Our highest aim, our greatest achievement is to serve him and honor him who has saved us. I went to the barber yesterday. My wife had been on me for two weeks. My little hair was curling up evidently back here. She said, you've got to get a haircut. Oh, yes, ma'am, yes, ma'am. I'm headed to the barber, honey. First thing tomorrow morning. That was yesterday. Barber said, you're being good. And the first thing he asked me when I sat down there, he said, you've been being good. I said, I've been trying. He said, ain't much fun, is it? So I knew I had a sinner barber. But little did he know, he had a wholeness preacher. He got a message before I left the barber shop. I got to tell him about this wonderful place called Fort Myers Rescue Mission. Where the Lord has raised up a place where 84 men can come and spend the night. Get a good hot meal three times a day. A shower. Clothes. The word of God. And I said the greatest thing we give them is the gospel of Jesus Christ. And he tried to repeat his statement again toward the end of our conversation. Ain't much fun, is it? I said, sir, I've had the greatest time in my life since Jesus saved me. I said, he saved my soul. He saved my life. He saved my marriage. He's given me everything that I could want. He's allowed me to have a part in his work. I said, sir, I am the happiest man in the world today. You can have all the fun you want. But I have joy and peace and the love of God in my heart. I don't know if he liked that or not, but he did give me a decent haircut. (laughs) But he charged me 12 bucks. What does it mean to be a Christian? It means to serve him. Now, I could have cowed down and just let his comment go unnoticed. I could have kept my lips shut and not been a very good witness. I could have just laid down and played dead spiritually. That's how you die. Is by laying down and playing dead. That's how you die. That's right. And by the grace of God, I don't want to die. I found life. He put something in me that has motivated me and stirred me and kept me at the job. You'll hear it over and over from me. I tell it. 
38 years. November the 18th, 1978. That's my birthday. The other one doesn't matter. It's back in 56. That birthday's in irrelevant until I get old enough to draw Social Security. <laughs> then it'll become relevant again. And I'll be glad I was born in 56. If there's any money left. <laughs> Who knows? But God, but God, life in the Spirit, it's different. The world can do what it's going to do, and it will. But we can have an existence over here in another realm that gives us peace and joy and satisfaction and contentment. Life in the Spirit is the way to live life. Amen? Amen. So we must realize as Christians and citizens of the heavenly world with an allegiance to our God, we need to be careful that we keep this relationship with Him going and the way we keep this upward relationship going is watch how we handle this horizontal relationship. Yes. And in this study, I think some of you guys will figure out why we preach against some things we preach against. Because you're going to find out in this study that this world is no friend to the Christian. It is not. John said, I have given them thy word. The world hated them. Or well, Jesus' words recorded in John 17, because they are not of the world. Who's he talking about? Christians. Christians. The disciples in particular. They are not of the world. Can that be said of you and me? We should evaluate that. Am I of the world? He said, I'm in the world. We're all in the world. You can't help that. By necessity. By your mama and daddy. You are here. You don't have a choice unless you choose to exit early, and I don't advise that. The quick way out is a quick way to a, a lost eternity. So don't, don't jump out of the frying pan into the fire, as they used to say down home. But you're here. You're in it. But you don't have to be of it. You don't have to be a part of all that it's doing and all that it believes in and all that it promotes. You better not be a part of it. As a Christian, we're going to find that out. He said, they are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. And we're going to do a whole study on Jesus and his worldly, uh, world philosophy. I pray not that thou shouldest take them out of the world. No, don't go to a monastery. Don't hibernate on an island somewhere and just live out your Christian life. Be little whatnots in my little, little Christian cabinet up here. I've got some really nice figurines that... That doesn't like, you know, the, the figurines, they make wonder, they're, they're beautiful little model Christians. I'm going to put them up here in my cabinet. Jesus doesn't have a Christian cabinet to put his Christians in. He has an ungodly world that he sprinkled you out in. So that you can be salt and light and ambassadors and witnesses. What a privilege to work for him. He said, I don't like the way the world treats me. I don't like the way the world treats me either sometimes. Jesus didn't like the way the world treated him. They didn't give him a fair shake, did they? No. Did they give Jesus a fair trial? No. Did they condemn an innocent man? Did they kill a man that had never done nothing wrong? And you expect to get by any easier? Come on. This is not an easy way. I'm not going to stand up and tell you that everything's going to be rosy for you if you give your life to God. It won't. Because there's a devil and a world that hates you and hates God and they're going to do everything they can to draw you back from where you're wanting to get to and that is in God. But you can have a life in the Spirit. Yes. Don't forget that. While I'm giving you the first three or four lessons that are negative, right. teaching you what the world is, don't you forget that there's something else that's better, okay? Don't forget, we're going to get to that. We're going to keep the love of God first place in our heart. And our affections are so important. Our affections pretty much dictate what we do. People do what they want to do. People do what they love to do. People talk about what they love. Did you ever notice that? Someone that loves sports, they talk about sports. Someone that loves boxing, they talk about boxing. Someone that loves stock car racing, they talk about that and so on and so forth. My wife talks about thrift stores. But I can say there's a real plus for having a wife that shops at thrift stores. I've saved thousands of dollars 
in clothing across the years of raising my family. And we wear nice enough clothes. Who cares if some rich guy wore them before we did? Remember what Brother Archie Atwell said about the lady that wore the mink? Brother, old Brother Archie Atwell preaching on pride. And he was, he, he pantomimed a lot of things out. He, he had this woman with this nice mink stole on. And he said, lady, don't you know that there was something that looked like a rat wore that before you did? <laughs> You know, we can get so proud over some things and, you know, so high and mighty over some things, but it's not about those things. As Christians, as Christians, we need to set our affections on heaven, eternity, the word of God, spiritual things. And he says here in Matthew 6, 33, ought to be your life verse. Everybody ought to take Matthew 6, 33 as a life verse. Seek ye first. Seek ye first. Not second, third, or fourth. First, the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And then all these other things that you're wanting, if you need them, they'll come along. Amen? We've had want or need of nothing since we gave our life to Jesus. Now, we've had some tight squeezes. God doesn't always put the money in the bank six months before you need it. Sometimes he lets you walk by faith right up to the door right up to the due date until it looks like he's not going to come through. And then by faith and in his great love and mercy, right at, that, right at the crucial moment, God always comes through. Praise his name this morning. But the key is, the key is you've got to keep him first. If you're going to be spiritual, if you're going to, wi- to live and have the benefit of being in the, spirits on the Lord, being in the Spirit on the Lord's day, when you're on the Isle of Patmos on the same day, yes, if you're going to have the benefit of seeing Jesus glorified, did he not see Jesus? Did he not fall on his face? Oh, when he saw the beautified, glorified Christ. Did he not talk to angels that morning? Oh yeah, they told him things to come. Did he not see things in the city of God? Did he not see the walls of Jasper, the gates of Pearl, the streets of gold? John saw all that while he was on this God-forsaken island because he was in the spirit. He had a citizenship over here that was working. Get your heavenly citizenship working. And the only way you can do that, I'm telling you, God will not play second fiddle to you or anybody else. He will not co-reign with self or sin or the devil. You say, well, God's got this part of my heart and the world and the flesh and the devil's got this part. God don't have any part. I'm sorry to disappoint you. He's not going to cohabit with evil. He's too big. He's too mighty. He's too holy. He's not going to dwell right alongside of sin in your life. But you can have a life in the Spirit that doesn't want the life of sin. Our brother preached it so well last night, our desires are changed. Our want-tos, my want-tos were changed the night Jesus came into my heart. He said he did that for you, preacher, but he doesn't do that for everybody. He will if you'll dig to the bottom. If you'll repent to the bottom. I wish I could resurrect Brother Donald Cassidy for about 15 minutes as he preached on digging a good foundation. And he would take his shovel and dig down. He said, if you're going to have a good building, you've got to have a good footer. I don't know how you guys build anything down here. It's all on sand. But up home, we can dig down till we hit rock. We can build on solid rock up there. You poor people down here build on sand, but it stays up. I don't understand it. But Brother Cassidy would dig down. The shovel would hit something, clink. And he'd throw out a beer can. He'd dig another shovel full. He's laying a good foundation for repentance. Digging a good footer for his spiritual house. And he'd just run his shovel in and he'd throw out something. The next thing you know, it could be anything. You, you just fill in the blanks. I'm not going to preach this whole message. I've got my message to preach. But we're to keep the love of God first place in our lives. Okay? First place. And 1 John 2.15 tells us not to love the world nor the things of the world. 
If our love is set on the world, the love of the Father is not in us. John was very blunt. Very blunt. You're either in or out, friend. You're either in or out. And if your affections... Now, I'm not saying you're not tempted. I'm not saying that something out there is not alluring. The world makes many things alluring. The world makes many things look pleasant, looks enjoyable, looks enticing. That's its job. Exactly. Is to make sin look good. They've got a, a billboard up. They don't put a 75-year-old woman up there with wrinkles on the billboard, do they? They don't put someone who's a little chunky in the middle on the billboards, do they? Who do they use? I mean, macho guys and very attractive lady, women. They're not ladies if they model for that kind of thing. The world is out to allure you. But Jesus can fix your desires and fix your hearts until you don't want the things that are wrong. It's a wonderful transaction that God wants to do. But John, you can read it there. John said, love not the world, neither the things that are in the world, because, friend, the world is evil. We're going to get into that Sunday. Tomorrow morning is mission service. Don't miss Brother Goodman. Be in here for the mission service. Missions like this mission are vital to the work of the church. So missionary services are very exciting to me. I love to hear. In fact, most after every most missionary service I've heard, I wanted to go where they were. I want to go. But be here in the morning. But Sunday morning... I'm going, to, I'm going to do something that's going to shake some of you up. I'm going to tell you who's running this world. And you're not going to, some of you are not going to like my answer. But I want you to hear me out before you cast me off. If you're going to stone me, wait till we get outside. Okay. But we're in the world. Jesus says we're not of the world. We have to not isolate ourselves from the world, but become the godly influence in the world. Can you see where there's a conflict here? Can you see where there's going to be a tug of war? The world's wanting you to do one thing. God's telling you to do something else. Can you see where this is very important for the Christian? To get a, a clear grasp of the world. My objectives, well, let me give you the scripture there in the middle of the back page, 2 Corinthians 4.18. The spiritual world is just as real as this physical world. I think he might have even mentioned that verse last night. He stole about two-thirds of my thunder. <laughs> but I love him anyway. Things that you can see, things that you can touch, things that you can visibly or physically handle, the Bible says are all temporal. Temporal. They're only here for a time. Everything you can see. I thought 57 Chevys would be the car forever, didn't you? You put a 57 Chevy by one of these new Camaros, which looks the nicest. I mean, you gotta, you got to face up to it. The new Camaros are sharp, aren't they not? They're sharp. 57 Chevys were sharp in 57. Some of us still like them. But they really, the contours, the, the colors, the, even the engines. I mean, they're coming out with some really powerful engines in this day of cheap gasoline. <laughs> but anyway, some things we thought would never, ever fade away, but it's faded away. Some of the places that have been built have been tremendous, but now they're rubble. Why? Because everything down here decays. Everything that you can see, touch, handle, or feel is going to pass away. But those things, those realities that you cannot see, God, you can't see Him with the natural eye, but is He real? Is God real? God can be real to you if he's not. If you couldn't answer me this morning, God wants to make himself real to you in this camp meeting, in this mission, where the gospel is preached. God wants to make himself real to you. 
And so God is real. The word of God is real. It's true. Every word of it is true. He said, you believe every word of it? Every word of it. Every word of it. Salvation is real. Say, preacher, I don't believe it. It's just a, who was the famous atheist that said it's just a crutch for weak-minded people? Sorry, Charlie. Sorry, Charlie, you got to me too late. It changed my life. It gave me something better for something bitter. (laughs) He took the old and gave me something new. He restored things that were of great value to me, such as my life, my peace of mind, my family. I have a wife. I have two daughters, two son-in-law, seven grandbabies. I am a blessed man. I'm a blessed man. I have friends all over the country. Even McCoys call me their friend. I am a blessed man. And in sin, you know what we did when we got mad at each other? We stomped each other's face in. We took a cue stick and whacked you over the head or a beer bottle. Said, you've seen that? I've seen all that. I've watched my cousin take the heel of his boot and try to cave a man's head in because they were angry at each other. Just stomping his head with the heel of his boot. That's mean. That's rough. That's ugly. And you say, do you miss that life, preacher? Do you miss going to the bars and getting hung over? Do you miss it, preacher? Not one iota, friend. Because my desires are changed. And my eyes are open now. I can see the folly of that mess. But 2 Corinthians 4.18 says, While we look not on the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen, for the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. The word of God, salvation, Jesus Christ, God himself, heaven, the spiritual work that God wants to do in your life. These are eternal things. This is eternal life that you might know Jesus Christ and his power to save. So that's what we're going to be talking about this week. The Lord helping us. We want to get those things across. My my objectives are listed there for you. I want to establish the reality of living a life for God in the spirit. It's a reality. It can be a reality for you. He said, I've been up and down. I've been in and out, preacher. I've been so unsteady. I've been like Reuben. Was it Reuben that said it was as unstable as water? I think it was Reuben, one of the sons of Jacob. He said, you're as unstable as water. You know, if you pour water out, it just goes wherever the land goes, you know. Whatever the elevation is, it runs downhill. I don't want to be unstable as water. I want my life to be settled and fixed and established by a power that is bigger than me. By a God that can keep what I commit unto him. He can, fellas. He can keep what you commit. The trouble is we don't commit at all. And he won't take 93%. So that's a pretty good percentage, preacher. But God won't settle for less than 100% of you. And if we don't give 100%, we're not going to get what he has for us. But I want to establish the reality of living a life in the spirit that is possible for you as well as these preachers. I want to establish in your minds the reality that this present world is no friend of grace and must be kept from exerting its evil influence into our lives. I want to establish the possibility of keeping ourselves pure in this ungodly world. It can happen. The necessity, number four, of separating ourselves from the evil that's in the world, whether it be their philosophy of life, their skewed understanding of science, their depraved sense of morality, which is immorality in God's eyes, their dishonesty, their fashion, their pride. The world has a lot of things against it from God's standpoint. And we're going to look into some of that one day. Then the glorious privilege of separating ourselves not only from something. That's negative, isn't it? God's taken something away from me. But he's going to give you himself. (laughs) What a trade. He's going to give you the Holy Spirit to enable you to walk with him. He's going to give you a fellowship of believers that will encircle you with prayer and love and support and help. 
He's going to give you the word of God as a roadmap. God's not just taking something from you, friend. God has something much better to give you. And so you separate from the evil, but you separate yourself to him. You present your body a living sacrifice. Holy, acceptable unto God, which is only, only your reasonable service. Is that Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1 and 2? And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is the good and acceptable and perfect will of God. That's where we need to be. That's where we strive to be. And then the example of Jesus. Jesus may well have been the most unworldly person that ever lived. And I want to look into that some lesson. That's what I planned for us this week. Sound like anything you're interested in? I hope it is. I hope it's not boring, friend, because this is the way to life. The world is the broad way that leads to destruction. Many there be which go in thereat. He said, is the majority always right? In spiritual things, the majority is almost always wrong. The narrow way is the way that Jesus wants you to take. And few there be that find it. But oh, how happy those few are. Just look at Brother Sarver. He's so sad he's a Christian. He can't hardly stand it. He's so gloomy about this thing, he can't hardly contain it. Right? Listen, friend, this is a great way to go. But there is a prescribed way to get from point A, the natural man, to point B, the spiritual man, there is a prescribed way and you have to do it God's way. He said, I think I can get to heaven this way. I think I can get to heaven by doing this. I think I can get to heaven by not doing that. I think you can only get to heaven by coming to Jesus Christ and repenting of your sins and being born again and then giving yourself completely. Shall we stand? Mr. Kovac is right on cue. He is standing.